Hello, friends. Mick here. Uh, by some miracle, we've managed to find ourselves at the headquarters of AMS Neve in the north of England. Um, look, there's George Martin. As you know, uh, I'm a bit of a fan of recording stuff and have become increasingly so. So we've come up to visit and we're going to just have a little bit of fun today. And this place is properly inspiring on so many levels, not least the manufacturing they do here, the R&D and all the amazing stuff. Um, I've managed to get Dan set up in an environment that's more happy for him. All right, mate? I'm a little bit cold, but that's okay. So we've come to a place of technolog technological amazement. And marvel and wonder. And you've managed to find <laughs> a disused canteen, a deluxe reverb. I know, look, he brought his guitar. Indeed. So in a minute, you're gonna meet Joe, who you might know from Neve videos. I felt like I knew him when I walked in. I've watched so many videos. Nick gave him a hug. <laughs> I was like, all right, mate, I've seen you for years. Uh, and you might see Matt, but pr predominantly Joe is going to help us out today. And we thought, why not take the opportunity to stick a guitar amp in a room and talk about some fundamental basics of recording a guitar amp. Now, it might seem crazy to come here to one of the, if not the leading brand in recording gear, to do such a simple thing. But we know that so many people struggle with it, so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to see what we can learn from Joe today. To kick us off, I've already learned one thing. This is a Blumline pair. Blum and purr. All the best parties happen in corridors. Look, there's Kate Bush. Macca. And in here, we're going to find the aforementioned Joe. Here's Joe. Uh, <laughs> in his natural environment. <laughs> <laughs> this is Matt. Hello. I said you'd meet Matt, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> and we've got some gear here just set up to record so we can decide what we're doing. Uh, I'll just come over and show you the back of the studio. In this room is a Genesis Black. Look at that. We've had a demo of this today and it's, it's mind blowing. That's what production looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so look, uh, I'm behind the cameras now. The reason we're doing this today, despite this being a place of recording legend, an audio gear legend and cutting edge technology and all kinds of things, we thought actually, why don't we just get some best practice advice on recording a really nice guitar sound. Mm -hmm. And um, Joe, we've picked an interesting uh, venue in which to do that today, or at least Dan has. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and we've set up a close mic on the amps, which I'll do a detail of that you can see. And there's also um, a stereo pair in the room. Uh, Joe, we've set up a Blumline pair. Could you explain what that is? Yeah, so it's it's using a combination of condenser mics uh, set, each set to figure eight and off axis. So they're set like this. And it's quite an old technique, but it, it gives you uh, a good account of the room that it's in. Uh, it, quite a bit different to an Omni uh, in that it, there's, there's some phase rejection going on. So... Uh, with the Blumline Pearl, you should get a good feel for the room, and it's quite a roomy room as well that we've chosen. So, And we've done that deliberately, so TPS normally uses um, either a mid-side or just a spaced pair. So we're, mm. I'm super interested to hear this today. Now, what you're also seeing is what probably looks um, extremely complex uh, from a home recording point of view, but actually, if we, if we go to the top of the stack there, we've mm -hmm. got a laptop up top. Yeah. So this this is just a, an Apple uh, Mac MacBook that's running Pro Tools, uh, very very basic setup. So you know this could be any DAW essentially, and we've set up three tracks uh, to record the three mics that we have in uh, in the other room. Uh, the first one is the the live mic going from directly from the amp, and that's with the Sontronics ribbon, uh, if I'm correct. And then we have the two condensers at the back. Uh, which are it's set up in the Blum line, so they're quite far away from the from the amp, aren't they? Um, and the configuration that we have here, so we've got the Mac, uh, we have the ATM, which is our audio interface, and we also have the the new product, which is the Neve 1073 SPXD, and this is basically a 1073 that's also got a complete audio interface interface off the back of it, so. 
you know you can connect this up to your computer just like you do the 88m or the setup that we have here because we want the three mics going on is this is connected to the mac via usb and then this spxd is connected into the 88m via adat so we've effectively got three channels going on into the daw that way yeah and for the if that seems complex to anyone out there you might have an interface um that's got two inputs on it obviously if you want to do three you need an extra input or you might have an interface interface that's already got four inputs on it we're recording three today as joe just explained what i'm going to do is get down to go and play and perhaps uh Joe, you could explain to us what you're hearing in the three mics and we can solo yeah. some and take some out. What I want to get a really good idea of is the real basic stuff like setting a game mm -hmm. level. Of course, and yeah. What we might want to think of in terms of basic EQ if we want yeah. to do anything. So bear with me. Back down the corridor of dreams. There's Kate. There's Fred. Uh, I'm going to find Dan again. You ready? Yeah. What I've asked Dan to do is play something relatively simple that's kind of a repeated theme, but also explore a little bit of dynamics. So I haven't asked him to go mm. whisper to really loud, but I have asked him to go a little quieter to a little louder. Yeah, excellent. Okay. So we can see on the three tracks here that we've got signal. Now we'll talk about track one first, which is this, this one on the left. And that's the main guitar track that's going through the SPXD. Uh, so what you want to do first is uh, to obviously get the physical connection going and you need to decide if you're using uh, a dynamic mic, a condenser mic or a river mic, whether you need phantom power or not. So if you're using a, con a condenser, you will need phantom power. For the other two, you don't need it. Uh, so that's via the phantom power switch here and it's a different button on different interfaces but it's usually very clearly marked. Once that's ready, um, you should start to see signal. Now, we can see the signal coming in here. Uh, it's actually too hot. We've clipped a little bit there. So I'm going to reduce the gain. And this is uh, on the 1073. We have a dual stage uh, transistor based gain. And this is all stepped in 5 dBs. And each click gives you an extra 5 dB of gain. So you can start to increase the level there. And with the 1073, you can meter it in different points. So you see here, this is the metering on the input stage. So if I start to clip here and I'm starting to get into the red, I should probably reduce the level down. So that's the signal coming in at this point. The signal then, it can either run through the EQ, and we'll probably talk about that in a moment. It then goes to the output level here. And this is like a an output fader you have on a, a Neve console. So you can adjust the level into the DAW via this switch. So I'm just going to clear those meters a second just to make sure we've got a good level coming in. One, one question I have while you're doing that, Joe, is I appreciate it's different depending on which interface you're mm. using, but we've got a system of green, orange, and red there. Mm. How, on our DPX uh, yeah. in the studio, how far can I go into the yellow? So you can, you can go quite a, quite far into it and there's a difference between analog headroom and digital headroom so with that with analog headroom you could you really you could be in the red uh, and as long as the the input level into the daw isn't clipping and you can start to saturate at that point and it's pleasant whereas digital saturation digital clipping is not pleasant at all and you really want to avoid that as much as possible it's, it's a subjective thing, really. If you're starting to use up all of the available headroom on the 1073, which is up to 26 dBU out. Um, so you can play with that as much as you want, uh, as long as it still sounds pleasant, really. Okay, so we've got a good level going into the DAW now by balancing the input and the output level. So if you had something like a 1073 LB, that also has two stages as well. So you have an input and an output level, you just don't have all the EQ in between. Um, For that, presumably the inputs um, on the, at the door level is mm -hmm. line, we're talking about a line level input here, are we? Uh, yes, yeah, so we're changing the microphone level uh, via the preamp into outputting into line level, yeah. which is then inputting into the analog to digital converter goes via USB into into the DAW there, yeah. Correct. 
So that's that's the basic process for our main mic. Is first of all set the the gain level to mm -hmm. so it's nice and you've got a good strong signal, but you're not exactly it. yeah yeah. And now because you have those two stages, what you can do is you, you can you can decide where you want to add more gain. So with the 1073, you've got a transformer balanced input that has these two transistor gain stages and. You'll notice on the pot here, you have a second off position. So I'm just gonna turn the output level down a moment. And I'm gonna increase the gain at this stage. So you can see I'm starting to, starting to saturate that now. Once I go to this point, it actually switches it off. And then any, any click above that is actually um, the second uh, transistor coming in. Now you can hear that the distortion we've added there, that's coming in at this stage, it's not, via a, a, the amp or via a pedal. This is distortion, distorting here. But by balancing the output level, I can still maintain a good signal that isn't clipping in the DAW. So you can hear the, the complete tonal change I've added there. And then I can back it, that off. Back to where we were. Go back to the clean. You just lower down, down a little bit for a second. Yep. That is, it's fascinating for me. So. I'm using this stuff day in, day out. That's mm. something I absolutely didn't know. Read the manual. <laughs> but of course, there we're into all those classic guitar sounds that you know about that were recorded yeah. direct to desk, right? That's what that yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. Well, th th this is where distortion, distortion came from. It was, you know, it was by pushing things too far, be it on a console or be it on the amp itself that didn't necessarily have an over overdrive at that time. It was just driving the clean amp yeah, as yeah, hard yeah. as it would go. Uh, you, you know, you could do that on the console end uh, back then as well. And you, as I was saying before, when as long as you're balancing the output and you're not clipping digitally, that can be a really pleasant uh, distortion. Uh, and you can kind of tailor that to whatever instrument you're working with. Obviously, we're working with a, with a guitar here, so it does start to sound like a distorted guitar as we uh, pump that gain up. But if you're working with a, a vocalist, yeah. for example, a microphone going in, that can just kind of enrich in all of the, the, the harmonics underneath it. And it even, even though it's pushing, it doesn't distort in the same way as, as a guitar would, for example. And that's all that stuff we're talking about with, um, you know, massive brand push here, but, you know, the classic Neve sound. That's what mm. that is, isn't it? How those harmonics go yeah. and how that tonal colour gets really interesting. It's certainly a big part of it, and it's, it's not something that was intended... Uh, back in the 60s and 70s when Rupert was really looking to get uh, the, the the best possible sound that he could out of the gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the time, adding transformers in gives you signal isolation and so on. Uh, and that was the best it could be. But as time's gone on, that character, and, you know, and more and more gear gets more and more transparent, yeah. that character seems to, to want to be injected back in and that, that's what people are looking after nowadays. So... The 1073 has that in, in spades. <laughs> and uh, and as you can see, you, you can decide how much of that you want. You know, yeah, you, yeah. you can go quite transparent with it and very gentle, and you can then kind of push it uh, into, into full saturation if you want to. Cool, I'm gonna get Dan just to loop around something else. Maybe we could just talk very briefly about EQ. Yeah, of um, course, yeah. On the, on the input level, uh, before we ever listen to the room mics. Exactly, so let's get back to a decent uh, level. So I'm not gonna push, into saturation. I'm just gonna get a nice clean level going in. So with the 1073, uh, you, in addition to the transformer input and then the transformer output stage, you've got this three band EQ in the middle and this is really a magical EQ. It has uh, musical frequency points that were carefully selected back in the day uh, to give a, a nice range of uh, boost or cut over these fixed frequencies. Um, and it's inductor-based EQ as well. So there's a lot of analog circuitry in there, a lot of a lot of copper that you're running through. So that you know you can just leave the bands flat, so that they're not boosting and cutting, but just engage them. And it's very subtle, but that's an old trick where you you, you kind of switch on the EQ, but you're not really changing the frequencies. You're just engaging it, and then. Say just so. down back a little bit, please. Yeah. 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 Cool. That's something we've noticed in the TPS studio. Mm. Literally just engaging the EQ, it gets fatter. Yes. A, th a thicker sound. It does. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
And then of course the, the, the EQ bands sound great anyway, so once you do sound, start to engage them. So, so that's the high band. And that's at 12k. And you can see even when I boost that all the way, I'm not pushing it beyond the bounds of musicality. You know, it's still a nice a nice sound. Um that's I always fine. I appreciate some of these words maybe not helpful sometimes, but I always think of that 12k. 10 to 12k is kind of air yes is that fair? yeah yeah well typically air uh, would be higher uh yeah. you know you usually you're talking above like 16k but the way this eq works it's a very gentle shelf that it does push that band anyway you know um so yeah it you, you can hear you can definitely hear it on the on the top end of the signal but it does boost the air above that as well yeah. so yeah and, and then it, moving on to the mid-range then. Yeah, so we've got the mid-range, and again, this is one that's really useful for guitars. Um, you've got the selectable frequencies here that you can you can toggle through. So I'm just going to boost. That sounds quite nice there, I think. Let's just add a little bit of that. And then we've got the low band. Uh, and the low band is, again, frequency selectable. So you can see we're, we're just starting to clip a little on the yeah. EQ, so I'm gonna back it off a little. He's, get, he's getting into it, yeah. So you can see with the, you've got the metering at different points, yeah, yeah. and you can see where where the gain is, is being applied. So if I'm clipping here, clipping at the EQ stage, or clipping at the output, you get an indication of that there and then you can balance the, the gain accordingly. So if you're pushing the EQ bands too much, you can back them off or perhaps back off the input gain to allow you to yeah. boost the EQ further. So I've, I've cut off some of that low band there. So yeah, I think a lot of people, um, it's a good thing just to underline there that when you are messing with EQ, you are fundamentally messing with gain. Yes. Because yeah. they're in different frequencies. Exactly, yes, yeah. yeah. And, and with an EQ that's quite broad as this is, um, and so pleasant sounding you you can you know typically you you, you want to be kind of subtractively EQing a lot of yeah. the time but with this you don't need to you, you can boost every single range so i boost the low mid and the high and obviously i'm adding more gain there but I, you know i like the sound of it so yeah, yeah. there are no there's no rules against that it's just something to be aware of that if you are boosting these ranges you're going to be adding more gain and perhaps clipping at the eq point so and can I make a guess? I can't see from where I'm stood. The frequency you liked was either 3.2k or the next one up. Uh, yes, I think, yes, we're at 3.2 there, yes, so yeah. So regular viewers of that pedal show will have heard me talking about 3.2k all the time. And again, another unhelpful word, mm. bite. Yeah, yeah, a bit of bite, bit of presence. That's kind of, that's where your, uh, your vocals would start to really pop out of a mix. And with a guitar, it, it can boost those, uh, those re the, you know, the, the presence frequencies that you would have on, on the dial uh, of an amp, typically. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at with, with that mid band. And then- <laughs> The red lights are telling us that Dan's really getting into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we've got the low band. You can see I'm boosting all three frequency yeah, bands yeah. there, and I'm kind of liking the sound of it. Uh, and then what we've, we, we have in addition to that is this high pass filter, which has uh, several selectable frequencies. So if I want to really thin it out, you can hear there, I can. So I can cut out all of that low end. Uh, you know, depending on what type of instrument you're working with, that might be useful. For a guitar, I find, you know, between the, um, the 60 and the, the 80 and the 100 hertz are quite useful, depending on what type of music you're, you're trying to record. And then I can let it all back through that way. You can see that's the EQ off. So that's another good practice is to always, if you're EQing into uh, your DAW and you're trying to uh, record the EQ in, always AB as much as possible. So take it in, take it out, and then really let your ears decide, um, you know, is the EQ doing what I want it to do, you know? 
Because uh, yeah. once you've committed, that's it. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's a. Um, actually, if we could knock down dive down down a bit more. Yeah. That's a, a, a. Especially as we move into the digital world, it's a hotly it's a hot topic, isn't it? How much mm -hmm. do you commit to when you track, and how much do you do post? Yeah. So yeah. I wonder if that gives us an opportunity now to we'll go through the same process with the room mm -hmm. mics, but because of the way the room mics are hitting the interface, mm -hmm. we don't have any available EQ at the input there. That's correct. So yeah. maybe we could have a look at that mm -hmm. as a sort of post. As a post yeah, post. exactly. So uh, so with the room mic, so we, we have the, the, the Blumline pair that's set up in there, and they're going directly into the 88M preamps. Now, these are slightly different to the 1073. So the 1073, as we mentioned, has that transformer in, EQ, and then transformer output stage. The 88M is technology that comes directly from the 88R console, so the yeah. big one you see at Abbey Road and Capital, and uh, but it's a much more modern console. So because of that and because of what it's designed to do, which is orchestral scoring and big uh, pop music recordings, the preamps aren't as heavy on the transformers. So you do have transformers on the front end, but it is op-amp based, and there are no transformers on the output stage, so it's electronically balanced. So, I mean, subjectively, it's cleaner, yeah. a bit more precise, uh, but it still has a, a, a nice amount of character to it. So in this kind of setup here, um, it's really good for the room mics. And because this is a single stage gain, uh, you have to be just really careful that you've got plenty of digital headroom yeah, there. Yeah, and you know, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're leaving the, the headroom going in so that um, you're not boosting too much. Uh, but you can still apply a reasonable amount of gain with, this, with the single pots and you know, phantom power again, because these are condensers. And that's the room mic. And then if we blend that with the down a little in the mix. It doesn't sound to be any great phase issue there. No, no, it doesn't sound to be. And again, we've set this up pretty quick. Yeah. Um, you know, you'd have to have a bit more of a critical listen, but it, yeah. it sounds good. You know, it doesn't sound like you're getting any cancellation there. So yeah. It does sound like an amp in a room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's a good representation of the sound of uh, the old the old Neve Canteen <laughs> where we're recording. <laughs> okay, what I'm gonna do then is um, Dan and I will just play like for a minute each. Mm -hmm. We'll record that. Yeah, yeah. And maybe we'll come back and have a see what happens post-wise. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool, all right, I'll just leave the cameras rolling and you guys can react to whatever we play. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> and Dan, we're each now gonna play for a minute or so. Okay. Uh, and Joe's gonna record it. We're gonna just get a bit of love glowing, going in the Deluxe here, and we know this is the Deluxe's happy place. Come on. So, um, hopefully the good people of AMS and Eve won't, <laughs> <laughs> won't have a cow, man. Uh, Dan. Ready? Yeah. So yeah, as the gains increase there, we can see that we're starting to clip digitally. So at that point, you just want to back off your gains just to make sure you're not using all the digital headroom. So I'm going to take the direct mic down a bit. And these room mics are definitely cl clipping a bit more now. add that EQ back in at this point and then just check the output level making sure that we're not clipping at all uh, anywhere in the signal chain yeah nice healthy level going in sounds good 
can see we're peaking a little bit on the EQ stage, but that's not beyond the realms of what's acceptable. You know, as long as you can hear it uh, and make sure you're not actually distorting, you can kind of saturate a little bit and it still gives you a nice tone. So. One thing we can do here as well, one thing we can do is we can add a compressor into this chain. So the 1073 SPX-D and the original 1073 SPX has an insert path that allows you to add, let's say a compressor here, into the circuit. So I add that in. So that's this compressor, which is quite heavily compressing, is in the circuit of the 1073 and it's currently after the EQ. So we've got preamp, EQ, compressor, output. I can press the pre button to change that so that the compressor is first. How was that? Guys, that was great. Really good. How, really how good. did we get on with the levels? Yeah, we, it, obviously when we increased the gain on the amp, then we started to clip a little bit here, but we, yeah. we dealt with it by adjusting the gain, which is good practice. Uh, you know, you increase the gain on your amp, you want to back it off on your preamps, and that's exactly what we did here. Uh, between the room mics on the single stage and then backing off uh, the close mic via the uh, input here and then taking the output level down a little. Where did we, just out of interest, where did we end up on the mic gain? Uh, I think we took around 10 dB off here. Yeah. And probably equivalent are here, actually, so around 10 dB. Yeah. So it's good doubling and more of, like, of extra loudness. <laughs> I know when we're hammering in the studio, I have it on the lowest yeah. uh, gain setting for the, for mm -hmm. the mic ins. But, um, yeah. I've, I've learned some stuff, Dan. Right. I didn't know. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, maybe we should switch to a post-conversation then. We've got our recorded guitar, mm -hmm. um, and you will have seen what was happening while Joe was recording it. So now we're in a situation where we're, our session's finished, we've, we've recorded our track, and now we've got our audio mm -hmm. to muck about with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And depending on how you've mic'd it, um, it's all, the, the main thing is, is balance and, and positioning. Um, so, you know, if you have the, if you have one mic on, uh, that's a close mic, then obviously that one should really be your central uh, central microphone, probably the loudest. Uh, and then the room mic pair that we have here, uh, I've grouped them so that they, they're controlled uh, as, a, as a pair. And I've panned them hard left and hard right, which is typically what you want to do if you're uh, doing a Blumline pair or uh, maybe a spaced pair or XY and so on. Uh, however, there's no hard and fast rules to that. You can pan them in if you want to, uh, but typically this is where, where I end up with, with three mics. How are you feeling about the 
because obviously to commit to a room sound is quite a commitment isn't it because the, <laughs> <laughs> how are you feeling about what we've recorded in the room? i think it's, it sounds really good actually uh the room mics um I, i'm really happy with with how they came out um you know consider it's a very quick type of setup and it's not a recording room <laughs> you know, that, that we would now. it is now <laughs> yes we would have never thought to record in there but um it i think it, it brings out the 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 guitar really well actually the, with the amp yeah so we have a playback so that's just the room mics now, at the start you can see here it's clipped yep. a little so that's when i was playing around with the gains and i think here we kind of got it solid i did have a play around with adding the compressor into the chain <laughs> uh as an insert here so okay. that was that, that's a bit later on uh but this this part is just the EQ and the preamps. So you can see that once once you blend, once you balance them and you pan the rooms out, and then you just get get them all all three of them together. You can kind of level up the rooms until you're happy with it, really. And then, obviously, you can do uh, any in-the-box processing at that point. You can add plugins or whatever, but any, anything you do there is, it's of course non-destructive uh, because you can change it whenever yeah. you want. And, and how much EQ did we commit to in the end on the main? Um, mic? Not that much. You can see here we've got a slight boost at uh, 12k on the high band, a little bit at uh, in the presence range of 3.2, and then we did boost some low end at uh, 220 so kind of low oh, mid wow. uh but we've but to, to counteract the low boost we also activated the high pass filter at 80 hertz so any of the okay. really low sub was kind of cut off completely how fast does that go off at 80 hertz uh it's uh, it's 12 db per octave okay so yeah. not super steep not super steep no yeah. no it's a nice uh nice roll off um so yeah, we we cut out any any unwanted rumble there, I think, and giving the, the low end a nice bit of uh, bit of warmth. Um, yeah. So then at this point, if you wanted to, if you wanted to bring some uh, some of these signals back uh, through these processors, uh, then there's there's a few ways to do it essentially. But let's say if we just ignore the room mics for now, and we want to process this. Uh, SPXD and add some more EQ to it. What we can do is we can create a new track next to it. Let's just create a, a mono track, um, and then we can set its input uh, as the ADAT input. So ADAT three. So I'll put ADAT one, and then the input is ADAT three. This one. Um, so basically, we can we can feed the output of the track that we just recorded uh, into the digital input of this unit. So I'll set this output, and the way this works is you activate the digi input at the front. Now I'm just going to mute just in case I get yeah, a yeah, feedback yeah. loop. So we activate the digi input. This cuts off the analog inputs here, and it feeds the uh, USB or ADAT signal in through the line portion of the uh, preamp. So you've got the microphone side over here and yeah. then the line yeah. side. So because oh, wow. this is a, now a line signal, yeah. we're going to bring that uh, back through. What's, um, what about latency at this point? So there will be latency if you're because you're doing a round trip here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and typically this is something you do at the mixing stage. Uh, but as long as you're only monitoring the output of this and yeah. not you don't you don't necessarily want to monitor monitor at two places so you yeah. wouldn't want to monitor the signal you're sending in and the signal you're bringing out yeah. you only want to monitor one of them uh, to avoid any uh, phasiness so now we're sending out of this track into the spxd and you can see here immediately it's getting signal i've got level so with the line amp we can reduce that so i'll put it at zero so you can see it's quite a hot level there yeah. 
but I can I can back that off if I need to. Welcome to that pedal show. <laughs> <laughs> so I I can bring that signal in, and then on this second track that we've created here, let's just make this live and set it to input monitor. So you can see I've got signal coming in there, yeah. which is actually the output of this. So yeah. you see. So we've created a, a loop going from the pre-recorded track back into the analog gear yeah. uh, and then out and back into the DAW. And, and in this case, Pro Tools is handling the routing of all of that. Yes, yeah. so the Pro Tools sees the inputs and outputs of these devices yeah. and it allows you to um, send to any of them. Uh, so in, in the I.O. patch, you can just, yeah. yeah and we should this. just say that, you know, if, you, if you're if you not a Pro, Pro Tools user, all of this stuff is possible yeah. in, in other DAWs. And exactly. it, it might be that if you don't have um, fancy outboard gear, you know, you're using a plug-in at this stage, mm. but the, the process is somewhat similar Mm -hmm. for what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve. Exactly, yeah. And then the process would be similar for any other analog gear you had in your studio. Uh, if you had an audio interface um, with inputs and outputs on it and you had some analog gear in, in your rack, maybe it's a compressor or an EQ or whatever, uh, this principle is the same. You just have to patch in analog cables from your interface into the, into the gear that you want to process. Mm. However, because these two devices uh, have analog circuitry and... Uh, they've got the digital outputs. You don't need to do any of that interconnecting between interface and the yeah. gear. It's all just happening via the USB cable. So it's you know you can just patch it in here dead quickly. So do you need to re-record that track? That's right. And then do you need to line that track up back up against? Oh, because it's real time. Real yeah, time. that's that's correct. So if I if I was to so let's uh, let's make it live here. So now we are listening from the the re-recorded track. Yeah. So so let's say. So it's coming out of that waveform you can see at the top. Yep. Going through the pre and then coming back in. Exactly. Yeah, and that's it. And I can I can level it down at multiple points. So I can turn the volume down on the pre-recorded track yep. to give me a bit more headroom coming in here. Now I've got the got the EQ in again. So let's. With this track, let's change the EQ a bit. So let's make it let's make it quite thin. Yeah. So you can see that 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 sounds very different to to what we were feeding. Yeah, in. And we right. EQ'd it quite heavily there, uh, just to thin it out a little. Okay. So what we would do um, is we would then. So we're feeding the signal from that pre-recorded track out into here and then back out again. Mm -hmm. So once that loop is, is set, we just press record here and then it will record onto the, uh, onto the second track down here. I'll just level that up a little bit. So you can see the level difference because yeah. we've thinned out the low end on the EQ. So we're getting quite a lower signal uh, here and we're also sending a lower level out just to get some more analog headroom. Okay. So then once you once you've then got that recorded, um, now there's multiple ways you can you can line up, but um, yeah, you, know, you can do it manually by just zooming by in and and seeing how far far away you are. There are pro, there are plugins that will do this automatically, and yeah. uh, there's alignment methods that you can do. But you can what's see. What's interesting about that is that we can see because of the time delay how far the room mics are out as well. Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. You can see the distance there. So that's the first recorded one, then this is this this round trip loop, and then that's the first of the room mics. And it might be that being that far phase moved for the room mics doesn't sound weird, but mm -hmm. being very, very minutely phase mm -hmm. moved. Anyway, this, that's a conversation, for another, yeah, 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 yeah. conversation yeah. for another day. Can we hear them on together? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let me just... Let me just manually move this one just a little bit just to get it phase coherent as much as possible. Uh, again, there are better ways to do this, but just for the sake of speed. Yeah, once again, <laughs> welcome to that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to take everything off record, set them all back to uh, the speaker outputs that we have here and make them all live. So 
that's predominantly the the loop through one. That's predominantly the, the first recorded one, which sounds the nicest. And then the room mics. So that sounds great. Yeah, I mean, and typically I, you would, you know, if you were doing a, a re. Um, or like a rebounce mm. through the gear of the one that you just recorded. You you probably wouldn't listen to both of them at once unless yeah. you're doing something creative with it and you were doing one that had a very different sound. Yeah. Typically, you would get rid of that first one or yeah, just, yeah. just mute it uh, once you're, you've then reprocessed it. But, yeah. you know, and, there and are no rules. And point, that could be reprocessing for EQ, for compression, for yeah. other effects. Exactly, yeah. Things. Yeah, that's it. So it, let's, let's, um, let's show you the, the compressor, actually. Yeah. So let's just do that, that again. So I'm just going to get rid of that one. And we'll do the loop uh, test again. So I'll just double check. I'm not going to feed back. So send the output uh, back into the input of, of this and then set this ready to record. Can we can we hear the bit of the later on with Nick playing? Oh yes, yeah. Yeah, let's go to that. So that would be after that. Now, we're doing the loop through from this track that we pre-recorded, going into the SPX and then back out again. Now, another great feature of this is that it also has an analog insert and we played around with that a little bit when we were doing the tracking, um, but that means I can actually get another, sig another unit into that signal path. So I can add this compressor into the analog insert of this which then goes back into the DAW. Where is the insert? So the insert uh, can either be before yeah. or after the EQ. So right. you've got this switch here, the pre button. So when I activate the insert, so that's at the compressor coming on. Stop costing me money. <laughs> <laughs> And this is, this is a diode bridge compressor, the 2254. So it's a very early design uh, that Rupert and his team came up with uh, in the early days of Neve. And it's a very unique design with a diode bridge circuitry uh, that gives you a really gentle compression. Um, but it also is it's very transformer heavy as well. So it's a very characterful compressor, mm. let's say. It's not something that's surgical. It's something that you add for tone. And... Uh, <laughs> Although I am adding some gain there as well. It, it will just thicken up a guitar as well. I can move that compressor before or after the EQ. So the, these two units, well actually these three, they're all working in tandem. This is my main audio interface. This is expanding it, giving me a full 1073 channel strip and all these extra features. And now the Diode Bridge 224 compressor are all working together. I've got an analog signal chain that's basically got probably six Neve transformers in it, uh, if I don't count the ones in here. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting the use out of those at the tracking stage, mm. and then I can bring them in again at the, at the mixing stage via a few routing options here. So Joe, you're a professional audio engineer, right? And you do this for a living. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things that uh, questions we get a lot when a, a a guy asks us you know how do I get that sound on Van Halen's you know Van Halen <laughs> one or whatever and one of the one of the big things that we're always banging on about is that you know you 
if you were in the room hmm. in our recording, the sound is so different. What the, yeah. what, and what you've demonstrated here is actually once you've got that track, not just hmm. the way it's recorded to tape, but once it's got that track, the post stuff is happening. Mm -hmm. Like you said, that track alone, you're going through six different transformers mm -hmm. to create that sound. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and I think some of those records by, you know, some of the best guitarists of all time, it's it's obviously, it's a combination of their, their sound from yeah. their gear and, of course, their, their playing style and talent and all of that. But then because there are so many different analog uh, recording points, mm. you know, and, and processing points in that chain before it went to, to the vinyl, all of that adds up yeah. and that's what you're that's what you're hearing uh, when you listen to those records without even knowing it really mm, yeah. um and you know the, the beauty the beauty of a, a good producer and a good recording engineer working together is if they can replicate it on vinyl what it sounds like in the room mm. you know and it it's not necessarily the uh, the transparency and uh, that you want it's kind of replicating on a pair of speakers what your ears will do yeah. when you're in the room with the amp and the player, you know. Uh, and that's, uh, I, th I think, I, my personal opinion is that you need good analog gear to get that. It's mm -hmm. a good microphone, it's a good preamp, uh, it's good processors like EQs and everything. Mm -hmm. And it definitely helps you along the way. It's not absolutely necessary, but yeah. it will get you closer to what you're trying yeah. to achieve by adding that in. Because the flip side of that, when you said that you have these stages and they all, add up helping you to get closer mm. of course with uh not even not even the wrong stages but just stages not set up optimally mm. they also add up in a negative way yeah yes <laughs> yeah so, exactly yeah yeah so <laughs> that's you, very true you yeah have, you have the stuff but you've got to really know how to drive it to get the most out of it yeah precisely and i think lay, lay, if, if you are layering different things on as we've done here yeah. we, we've added eq at the tracking stage we added some compression at the tracking stage then we're doing all that again mm. you can hear if, if you push that too far you, yeah. you, you very lose. quickly you yeah, lost yeah. it and yeah. it falls off the edge yeah. it starts to distort in an unpleasant way yeah. uh so yeah it's a fine line and you've got to kind of it's it's, it's a question of layering subtleties sure. on top of each other uh, i think yeah that's, that's why then world leading uh, producers mix engineers and <laughs> and engineers get uh, get paid so much, isn't it? Because exactly. They, they know what they're doing. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I, would, I, I just, I just, for the sake of the tape, back up what you said. You know, since we've moved to an analog, a predominantly analog front end workflow, anyway, mm -hmm. the amount of additional work we have to do in terms of post is is just so minimal. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny hearing the Dan's SG we know really well, the Deluxe Reverb we know really well, that miking setup we know really well. Yeah. Hearing it in here, recorded in a nice analog way through those flaming monitors. <laughs> that definitely helps as well. The and monitoring, we, that's we, something I didn't mention. That's very important. That is, I mean, that's as good as I, we, we did it in five minutes and that's as good as I've ever heard it sound. Wow. Mm. So, <laughs> and it also goes to like, you know, we've put a lot of energy and effort into getting our thing right, but it highlights for me as great as recording at home is and everyone should do it, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you've got to record, even if, even if it's just recording your phone, everyone should record their output. But it highlights for me the necessity to still have great studios and yeah. great engineers. Mm -hmm. You know, these these monster tracks that we hear, it's not done by accident. Yeah. You know, there's yeah, so that's much true. skill yeah. mm -hmm. uh, in those amazing things that we hear. Yeah, and it, it's it's having a, a second pair of ears, a ex very experienced pair of ears who's been there, done that, with lots of different genres of music mm. perhaps, who just gives you that, that feedback on what you're doing and lets you just focus on the creativity. Yeah. You, you know, you, you're not going to get that at home. Perhaps you do have more space and more time, but you're not going to get that feedback and, and experience uh, by doing it on your yeah. own. So and that's, also the time isn't necessarily a good thing. <laughs> I've been like four songs, what, three yeah. years now or something, I've been working on four songs. Oh, I've got all the time right. in the world. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, going to the studio going, right, we've got to have it 
yeah. nailed. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. You put yourself under a little bit of pressure once yeah. you once you're well rehearsed and you're ready to go. And there's definitely there's a place for both. You know, there's it's great that there's so many home studios out there now and it's great that there's so much good gear that people can actually afford yeah. you know and be able to do this it's made uh recording way more accessible than it ever has been in, in, in history uh but also the stu big studios have their place and i think they always absolutely. will you know yeah, absolutely yeah. amazing okay let's say thanks to joe um we did cover some basics at the start it got relatively more complex in the middle but um it's been a real trip to come here and uh, and do this with you so thank you no problem at all. No, it's been great to have you up here and uh, more than welcome to come again and uh, check out some more of the gear we have. Dan and I are building bunks in the next room. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for teaching me that our old Neve canteen is actually a really good recording space. <laughs> <laughs>